Now let's return to chapter four and move into, I suppose, the the uh, heart of of one piece of chapter four, which is specifically managing student behavior in the classroom or in the school building. Um, it, it is a topic of, of uh, that, that gets uncomfortable for some people, and it shouldn't be. Um, we An important part of parenting our own children is teaching them how to um, exist as social citizens in, uh, in whatever setting they find themselves in. Uh, a critical part of preparing oneself for adulthood is learning to comport oneself socially within the boundaries and the norms of, of the group and the context and the culture. And so this is a natural part of, of child rearing and it is a natural part of working with students in the classroom. As I've already alluded to, I fundamentally believe that effective planning of the instructional elements of the school day and the classroom can can mitigate a lot of the the potential for negative behavior on the part of students. Um, kids are kids, frankly, whether they're five years old or fifteen years old or fifty five years old. Um, I mean, let's face it, right? We're adults. Uh, I go to college meetings here in a college of education, and I take my laptop with me. And when the, the speaker gets boring or the presentations grow tedious, I go surfing out on the Internet. I'm not paying attention. I'm not listening. And I'm a professor of education sitting in a room full of us. Um, adult, all of us, it's human nature. Uh, if if we are not sufficiently engaged, if if the stimulus isn't sufficiently engaging, wow, there's a Skinnerian behavior term. Uh, but um, if if we're not drawn into the experience, we will rapidly tire of it. We will disengage. For young children and for adolescents, that disengagement. Um, the, the Puritans uh, had a little saying hundreds of years ago, idle hands or an idle mind is the devil's workshop. What they meant by that was if, if, if a child wasn't sufficiently engaged with some productive and positive behavior, they would find something to engage with that was not p positive and was not productive. And so learning to manage these behaviors in the classroom is a big part of being a teacher. As a matter of fact, there is research uh, from a number of places. The U.S. Department of Education frequently uh, surveys teachers of all kinds and sorts and has large data sets available. Uh, it, it continues to be the case that the number one reason that teachers quit and leave the teaching profession before a normal retirement is frustration and tension over managing student behavior in the classroom. So we're going to tackle it um, right up, right head on uh, with some discussion right now. You don't have a field uh, or clinical experience assigned for this course, and so you're not going to be in a classroom yourself this semester, unless I know there are some of you that are paraprofessionals, or in a couple of you are already teachers and in the classroom. Yeah, so you, you are in with kids uh, even right now, but most of you aren't. We will consider some issues of classroom management when we watch some master teachers teaching students on video uh, later on in the in the course. First of all, uh, let, let's talk about this in the standpoint from the standpoint of historical um, issues. Um, we we now we talk about classroom management. When 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 I was getting my teaching degree many many years ago, uh, we didn't talk about classroom management. We, we talked about discipline. Uh, and, and in fact, in some there were some textbooks uh, that used the word punishment. We would look for appropriate punishments for students. Um, we we have moved away from that, and I think appropriately so. It's not the role of of the adult teaching professional to punish inappropriate behavior. Uh, our job is to motivate appropriate behavior, to encourage appropriate behavior, to plan for appropriate behavior. My philosophy and my finding from my own practice is that good planning will take care of most, not all, <laughs> most uh, incidences of disruptive behavior on the part of students. 
and it's never going to call uh, never going to fix everything not when you're working with kids uh, but it helps and it, and uh, and it uh, and so that is the conversation we want to have what we mean by classroom management your textbook covers this very well uh, we mean that effective classroom management is is uh, a classroom that is designed to prevent inappropriate student behaviors it's designed so that we help students develop self-control it's a very and very important thing we have to teach students to behave appropriately uh, it is it is in fact quite cognitive and social we learn how to be uh, humans in an environment in a social place and then we also want to suggest procedures uh, in our management plan that will allow us to deal with inappropriate behaviors when they happen and they will happen and we want to have a plan for these disruptive behaviors and inappropriate behaviors so that we don't have to spend a lot of time figuring out now what am I gonna do with you today now, we, we already have a plan we already know what we're going to do and we simply follow our plan and effective teachers have a plan for managing behavior they follow that plan First, uh, or, or I suppose in sequence then now, let's uh, point out some of the key behaviorists, uh, behaviors, the key theorists who have spoken in their research to the issue of how students behave, how they manage their own behavior, how we can help them manage their behavior. I like to frame it like that. Our goal as teachers is to teach students how to manage their own behavior and to learn to be um, effective and participatory citizens in that social community first of all of the classroom but then the broader community and the job site as they move in that direction so starting historically in sequence B.F. Skinner um, many of you whatever your your background field you've had a psychology course and you've perhaps crossed paths with B.F. Skinner uh, and his view of behavior modification and and uh, behavioral conditioning and um, interesting work you can YouTube uh, some interesting videos that are out there historical ones I think there's one out there with an interview of Skinner's daughter um, she participated as a toddler in some of his experimental studies that they seem draconian by today's standards but they were really quite humane and, and Skinner learned a lot um, and from behavior modification uh, point of view and, and this even though it's old it is still quite effective as a strategy for some students um, we always emphasize that every one of these techniques every one of these theorists they gave us ideas that work for some students uh, nothing's going to work for every student or that would be the only thing in the textbook right um, the trick is for the teacher to have a whole bag of tricks and to keep trying things until you stumble upon the one that works. Skinner talked about modifying the student's behavior through the use of, of, uh, of reinforcers. Uh, we reinforce positively the behavior we want to see happen more regularly. Um, and, and we ignore, uh, and the, by ignoring the negative behavior, we extinguish its prevalence. Now, Certainly that doesn't apply to uh, kinds of behaviors that are immediately dangerous to a child or to a group of children. You can't ignore that. You have to respond. But he's talking about the slow and steady developmental process of teaching kids to behave and in certain ways. His basic principles, you can read them in the textbook, but essentially we want to identify the behavior we want modified. We collect some data. How often does it happen? Maybe, maybe we have been driven to our last nerve by this child or group of children. And if we take two steps back and breathe, maybe it's really that they're not doing this all the time and doing this negative thing a lot. Maybe it's just that the time they do it happens to correspond with a point where you're on your last nerve. Maybe you have little Johnny in your seventh period of the day and by then your knee is hurting and you are tired and he's getting on your last nerve not because he's any different from a kid you had in your first period class but because you are different you're tired it's not to say 
Johnny maybe needs a little reinforcement in a different direction. But we identify it, we collect some data, and then we consider causing a change by reinforcing in a positive way something else that we would rather have happen. We use a reward, an extrinsic reward uh, for younger children, perhaps an intrinsic reward for an older student. Um, and then we, we choose the type of positive reinforcer that we want to award with. And so, and there's, you, your book can go much more uh, deeply and does, uh, and there's a great deal of reading on Skinner and, and approaches to reinforcements. Um, I, I note a few of the reinforcers that are listed in the textbook, social reinforcers, uh, verbal attention and praise of, of behaviors. Catch them doing good is an expression that went around a long time ago. And, and I think it, the, at the underlying idea is very good. Um, a lot of times we focus on the negative. We don't focus on the positive. A lot of times we allow our classroom management to be responding to some bad thing that some kid does. And the only time that classroom management ever surfaces in the room is, is when we are extinguishing a negative thing. I'd ask you to consider reframing that as you read this section. The notion of catch them doing good. Wow, I like the way Sue is reading quietly and obviously attending to the assignment, right? And we praise the behavior that we want everybody to be doing. That's a very, very important one. Uh, for those of you that are going to teach younger children, graphic re enforcers are quite effective for some kids. Uh, we use behavior charts. Uh, we, we, we let kids earn gold stars or smiley faces or tokens. Um, perhaps we let them save up stickers and, and they, they uh, earn a pizza party at the end of the week. Again, uh, there, there, there are discussions about whether these things are appropriate or not. I tend to be a pragmatist. If these kinds of rewards work with kids, use them. Right. Uh, although just as a caveat, you can spend a lot of money on those kinds of things. And as a young teacher, those are going to be hard choices for you to make. Uh, but again, there, there is a research on this, and we do know that these reinforcements work. Last thought there, and then I'll move on. Don't neglect the idea of using these positive reinforcers with older students. Some of you will be teaching middle schoolers and high school students. Um, I, I, I go out to high school sometimes to watch our student teachers uh, in classrooms, and, and I hear sometimes something that's quite disturbing to me, uh, an expression, something along the lines that where a teacher would say to a class, you know, hey, we're adults here. I don't need to say to you to behave yourselves. Whoa, how come? Wait a minute. I've watched classrooms full of school teachers get out of control and get off task. Why do we think that because they're 16 or 17 that a candy bar or a smiley face isn't going to just add a little happy thought to that student's life and existence in school and somehow motivate attentiveness and better behavior? Uh, don't neglect that with the older kids either. Uh, move, moving on now, um, uh, different from the behavioral uh, school of classroom management and, and Frankly, these are broader than just classroom management. All of these researchers and theorists uh, looked more broadly at the issue of human psychology, uh, but we're, we're taking them and applying the research into the classroom management uh, situation. But the Cantors, um, and depending on your age, you experienced assertive discipline uh, in the classroom. Um, the, the Cantors... Um, they adopted um, Skinner's work in behavioral conditioning, but they, they also had a strong cognitive and moral basis to theirs as well. Um, they did emphasize reinforcing appropriate behavior, and they, they also talked about consequences, negative consequences for inappropriate behaviors. And so where, where, um, where Skinner would perhaps say we, we reinforce the positive and ignore the negative, the Cantors were more assertive than that, assertive discipline. Um, 
They, we will, in fact, uh, re reward appropriate behavior, but there are going to be negative consequences if you act out in class. Um, and so you've seen, uh, for example, uh, classroom management systems where the teacher on the first offense will write a name on the board. A second offense will put a check next to it, and if there's a check by your name, you're going to miss 15 minutes of recess. Uh, if there's two checks next to your name, you will stay after school. Um, and clearly those check marks and the consequences um, you never, ever, ever start dishing out consequences until you have verified with school administration what are acceptable negative consequences that are within your authority as a classroom teacher. There are some schools where it's quite dangerous, for example, to keep a child after school. Uh, what if that kid doesn't have a way to get home? What if that school bus is the only source of transportation home because a single parent is working uh, and it's a latchkey kid? You keep that kid and they miss the bus and now what? Who's going to get that child home? Always watch those negative consequences. Um, one of the big pieces that comes out of the Cantor's work, however, is the, fa the idea that classroom management is not only about these behaviors, but it's also about moral rights. Um, the teacher has a right as a professional to expect appropriate behavior from students. Not only that, the other students in the classroom have a right to an education and to an educational environment where they also um, have a right to be free of the disruptions from other students. And so this is a, a big part also of assertive discipline in the classroom. And the other thing that I would comment here is, is this issue of positive consequences. Um, and when you have students who are consistently doing the right thing, man, those kids get ignored a lot. Uh, you're, you're pursuing being a teacher. There are some normative um, assumptions here. A lot of you were pretty good students. A lot of you never were on the wrong side of the law of the school. Um, I happened to be one of those kids that pushed everybody's buttons and I, I stayed in trouble and and, uh, and so I, I do sort of get it. I was never uh, the kid with all the gold stars. I, I, I had teachers literally run out of chalk putting checks next to my name on the board. Um, but um, for those kids that are always above and beyond, uh, part of what the Cantors um, acknowledged was that you need to to do something positive for those kids. Uh, a, a note home to little Susie's mom, hey, I just want you to know that your daughter is always prepared for work in the classroom. Um, you, you never know how far something like that's going to uh, to go forward. Um, the, so, so the canters. The, the, um, I, I'm not going to go in detail uh, in lecture form with Dreikers in and with the Albert um, School in your textbook as it's covered. I, it's not to say that's not important. I encourage you to read carefully and to summarize those sections in the chapter. However, I am going to skip down to William Glasser's work. Uh, I had the opportunity to study under Richard Glasser. And, uh, and I have come to really appreciate his work. Um, Glasser uh, was a psychotherapist, and Glasser brought something called reality therapy uh, to a discussion of how teachers are to work with students in the classroom. Um, I've got a couple of his books somewhere on the shelf here. And, uh, yeah. and uh, reality therapy for teachers is something that bridges that gap between therapy. So in a sense, we're looking at dysfunctionality. That So a student is acting out out of some uh, dysfunction in terms of their social understanding. And they, they lack an understanding of normative conditions in social settings. And so Glasser brings reality therapy. And what he wants to work with uh, all of us on, and what he wants you working with students on, is the issue of self-control. Um, the, um, the condition of the present, uh, the textbook quotes him actually, rather than that of the past, contributes to inappropriate behavior. Glasser would say, you know what, I don't care where you're coming from. I don't care what your life's like out there. When you come into the classroom, 
this is where we are right now and this is my expectation for how you're going to act, how you're going to behave, how you're going to conduct yourself. And we can sit down and have a conversation uh, and we can establish what the class is going to look like and how it's going to run. This is a, one of my favorite parts about William Glasser's work. He emphasizes student responsibility to learn and to take on that responsibility themselves. And he also emphasizes um, that, that students need to develop that locus of control and the teacher's job is to scaffold that. And one of the big ways to scaffold appropriate behavior, according to Glasser, is for the teacher to have students take ownership of the process. And so in a Glasser sort of model, the teacher would convene at the beginning of the classroom some sort of classroom meeting. And in this classroom meeting, the teacher would essentially hold up a blank piece of paper to students and say, you know what, how would you like to have class every day? What do you think appropriate behavior is for students in, in the room? And not only that, what do you think I should be doing every day as a teacher? And Glasser would say the teacher and the students need to talk this out and they need to describe the reality that they would like to live in on a day-to-day -day basis in that classroom and you put it down on paper. Um, some models that, based on Glasser's work you actually develop a formal behavioral contract. This is what I commit to doing every day. I will have my homework ready. I will be in my seat when the bell rings and ready to start the day. I will uh, I will keep my hands to myself. I will not engage in negative this, that, and the other. And the student actually commits to these behaviors and signs it. And the parent signs it. The teacher signs it. And likewise, the teacher commits to the students. Every day, I will be here and I will be taking care of our business and I will have material ready for you and I will lead you and so forth. Um, and this is the kind of of, uh, of um, empowerment uh, that Glasser suggests we build for students. And, and by the way, he's not just talking about high school kids or middle school kids. Glasser models, um, he would suggest we start with the youngest of kids, that, that a kindergartner, by the time that, that uh, uh, kindergartner is transitioning from concrete operational to more formal operations in Piaget's sort of work, you'll get that in your Ed Psych course. By the time that, that kids about four or five years of age, they're able to explicate what good behavior is and they're able to consciously describe and discuss those kinds of behaviors. And Glasser is, is saying to the teacher um, that this is something you need to formally enter into and, and I encourage you. I, I think in my experience that's been one thing uh, that I have found very usable with all the ages of students that I've taught. I, I begin the class uh, semester or the school year with, with a conscious moment where we're going to talk about our expectation for what the school day is going to be for the rest of the year. And, and what do you want me doing as a teacher? What do I expect you doing as a student? How do we sort out disagreements and tensions in the room? What's going to happen if, if these things are violated and, and because we want to protect the rights of everyone that's in the school there. See, a little, little dose of, of Lee Hanter that pulled in there at the end of that little thought. So these are some researchers who have talked to us about different ways to plan for, different strategies that I can build in to plan for, um, for um, um, being an effective uh, classroom manager. Now, I have a, a chapter assignment out of chapter four, uh, and I'll have a little written assignment that'll plug up into the, the content folder here in just a minute. Um, but um, on page 75 in the textbook, and I'll have, again, I'll have this retyped, 
Um, it, it asks you in the textbook, and this one's not marked activity or exercise. You, you know, I'm going to struggle with that all semester. But this is simply in the text, but I'm going to make it an assignment. It says to use the criteria of your own feelings and your own knowledge and values and perceptions and construct some kind of classroom management plan. What I'm going to ask you to do is, is to look at all of these theorists of classroom management here in Chapter 4 uh, and a few more that I didn't mention that are also available for you here. And in one page, I want you to um, create a plan for how you will manage student behavior in your classroom. And I want you to keep this to one page, and I have a reason for that, right? Um, I, I want you to have this one page classroom management plan, and you'll submit it to me. I'll give you feedback on it, and we may have to revise it a time or two. But I'm thinking about that moment when you're going to apply for your first job. And I know for a fact, I talked to my teacher friends and my principal and administrator friends, new teachers are going to be asked in the job interview, have you thought about how you're going to manage student behavior in the classroom? And I want you to be able to say to that principal who's interviewing you, yes, Mrs. Smith, uh, not only have I thought about classroom management in the classroom, but I have a written document here. This is at least um, my general plan for how I'm going to manage student conduct and behavior in my classroom. Um, and it's based on such and such researcher. Uh, and, and I understand I'll need to adopt your own school policies into my plan. But I've put some thought into this so much so that I've got it down in writing. You see, I know, and that principal knows, that the most frustrating part of being a teacher and the part that's most likely to trip up a new teacher is managing student behavior. And so if, in fact, you, you, have, you can demonstrate with that one-page document that you've thought about it, you're going to make yourself look more employable in that moment, in that interview. So, classroom management.